Okay. All right, we're on. We're going to continue with so, Brihat Parasha or Hora Shastra questions and answers, right? Yes, the section 16 and 17 is next. 16 and 17 in chapter 3. Yes. Any specific questions or do you want me to just start? <clears throat> I, I do have three questions. Okay. But should I just read the general thing or you have it there? Yeah, the I have it. Why don't you read it for the, for the viewers? Okay. So it's, it's talking about the planetary complexions. It says the sun, the lord of the day, is blood red. And moon is light brown. Mars, whose um, stature is not, high, is not high, is blood red, while Mercury's complexion is, is akin to that of grass. Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn should be known as also being dark and multicolored. Now, that's interesting. You're reading from this book? I am reading half of it from actually reading it and the other half from memory. <laughs> Weird okay. reading. Because it's different. Yeah. There's different specific words in this one. Okay. Um, yeah, so what's the question? So, yes, the question, yes. Um, so I wanted to see, because in today's society, when we talk about someone's compl complexion and the color of their skin, it comes with a lot of connotation behind it. So there must have been some sort of a significance in this text to say that the native will have these complexion attributes which is related to their color so i wanted to know what's the significance of that in the context of this text and astrology yeah that's very interesting so see the reason why i'll take off my glasses because i don't really need them to talk to, to you but i need them to read <laughs> so don't get don't get upset if i take them on and people are like oh, are your glasses bothering you and my glasses are fine they're cool but i just i'm not I used like to wearing them yes all right so I, and also i think i have to get like not self-conscious that i'm wearing glasses I'll just try to keep them up. Yeah, try um, to keep them up. Yeah. All right, so there's a couple of reasons why planets are associated with colors. Mm -hmm. And as you said, like one of the things is that there's a connotation of complexion to race, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so that's actually quite useful and important to associate planets with different races. Okay. And, and it's done by, by this consideration of the color. Okay. Yeah, so the color of the, it's actually the complexion they say, right? It's not just the color, is it? No, it's complexion. And then the commentary below is talking about the effect of the ascendance, particularly on skin color. Yeah, we don't particularly care about the commentary because I don't even know who this commentator is, you know? Okay. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll take a commentary of a person into consideration if I know that they have some, if I have some reason to admire them or something, you know? Of course, everybody, everything anybody says is interesting. This person must know something. But I don't, definitely don't weight the commentary equally with the original text at all. Um, yes, yeah, so therefore you can know that certain races have certain dominance of, of planets. So just like you don't really read, you don't read the horoscope of a woman the same way that you read the horoscope of a man, right? Because yeah. one's a woman, one's a man. So if there's prominent Venus in the horoscope of a man, the actual outcome is different than if there's prominent Venus in the horoscope of a woman. They wouldn't look the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, similarly, if there's prominent Mercury in an Asian person's horoscope, it's going to be different mm -hmm. than if there's prominent Mercury in an African person's horoscope. Okay. Because different races have receptivity to different planets. Different genders have receptivity to different planets, different races have uh, receptivity to different planets, different periods of history have receptivity to different planets. What determines this receptivity in different space-time locations? I think that there's different structures that are made from the nature, uh, there's different structures that are made from the nature of different planets, like a female structure is made from the moon and Venus. I see. So that having that body is just makes the person more of a sponge towards the effects of Venus and the moon. Whereas having a male body is it, that body is made of sun and Mars. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be more receptive to the energy of, to the energy or whatever, to the implications of the sun and Mars in that horoscope. Having an Asian body is 
more attuned to the nature of Mercury. Okay. So the presence of Mercury in the horoscope is more influential on the Asian person. Okay. Yeah, so if we go through the colors, you'll see that they correspond to the complexions of, okay. of different human races. Yes. Right. So if Mercury, for example, is supposed to, now the words and the colors, we, we've done this before, didn't we? Didn't we talk about colors before? No, but you are, you have talked about it right now in your live class series. In the other one, right? And this is a yeah. useful text in relation to the live series because in that, at the end of the Briyat Parashara Shastri, he says, I told you about the colors of the planets before, and this is yes. the verse that he's talking about. He said, you know, you should make, make the color, offer the colors of cloth and flowers that are corresponding to the colors of the planets. I told you about those colors before, he's talking about this. Right. So... Yeah, so the, the words are a little bit difficult to unpack. So he's going to say that the sun is blood red. Let's see what, what he's saying there. So, you know, one would have to look this up. Swatashama. What is, what is Swatashama? What is Swatashama? It's not a very po common word, or maybe that's a different, maybe that's not, uh, maybe that's Kita Shama or Rakta or something. Gouda, Gouda, Kotro, Nishikara. All right, so what he's saying is, maybe we should look this up actually. Okay. But it's hard for me to, to do this online. The different they, one of the tricks of Dave, the difficult things of David Nagri is that the, the letters that they use to write yeah. in books in Sanskrit is that the ways that you can com you take a single letter and it's based on a stem, which is the vowel, and then you add these consonant parts to it, and then it doesn't have to necessarily be written the same exact way. There's different ways that you can add the consonant parts to it. I see. So okay. there's more than one way to get a letter, and I'm. I'm this one looks do you, like... Do you want me to email it to you? That, no, no, I have it. But what I'm saying is uh, I need to play with some font or something and see what font is this? What letter is that? I'm not so familiar with Dave Nagri that I can just figure it out. By eye. Okay. But let's just say what he says is, okay, blood red. Actually, the sun's... It's got the word Shama in there, which means dark. Okay. Dark. So the sun's color, it's naturally going to be red. But like I said before, it's a dark tan. Mm -hmm. You know? So like... American Indians, the red people, right? Okay. Or, you know, the Mexicans, the Mexicans, the, all the Native Americans. This, the tone in their body is more dark red. It's, okay. it's, it's a darker color like Shama, but it has a redness to it. So those people are very sunny. Even, even the Mexican people called themselves the people of the sun. That was their name for themselves. We are the people of the sun. Okay. Yeah. So they associate a lot with the sun, and they're very sun-oriented people. Then the moon, who's the day, who's the night maker, is Gora. Gora. Now, Gora is another difficult word to really understand when you don't have a picture of what it looks like with your eyes, but it means very fair. So it's like okay. Caucasian. It's a very like a white color. So I the. The the Caucasian people are moony. You know they're they're milky mo moony. They're not hardy like the like the Native Americans. Native Americans are hardy, strong, and kind of independent. But the Europeans were more grouping. They were always making their little kingdoms and groups and everything. Native Americans were just like there was seldom that they made this huge cultures and tribes. They they kept their little separate clans and stuff. Uh, so he says Mars is tawny. That's like, you get, what does tawny mean even in English? So it's difficult to understand the terms. Gora. Mm -hmm. Gora means fair. Okay. Mild. And now Mars has two qualities, not just a, a um, not just a color. He mentions that it will also be short. Short. It'll be shorter and they'll be blood red. I'm not sure who this is, what race this is. 
Ernst Willem made a book a long time ago called Graha Sutra, where he took yeah. some of, uh, many of these verses mm -hmm. and you know like assembled them in a separate book and gave his commentary on it. And he had an he had an interesting way of associating mm -hmm. that to a race. I can't remember what it was. But is he saying that Mars is short here? Because he's saying Mars, whose stature is not high. Yeah, it's Mars is short. See, the thing it's is, short. yeah, Mars is muscly. It's, it's not really short. But right. Mars is going to make a person... Stocky? Stocky, strong. Okay. Thick. Um, durable. Dur it makes okay. durable people. If, if okay. we find a durable reddish race somewhere, then that would probably be... A real martial race, but also like they would, you would expect they would have to be like pretty good warriors. These like durable. Yes. What do you think? You found one? No, I was thinking Scottish rugby players. There seem to be, they're not short, but they have so much. They're packing so much muscle. It's just yeah. like, but strong at the yeah, same but time. They're kind of white. They are fair. They're not blood red. But I mean, they have red hair. That's interesting. So they may be more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so now he says Mercury is like grass, right? This is what the mm. translation is. Yes. So actually, Kuja Sate Durvash. Yeah, Bute. It's really like grass color is yellowish. It's a yellow or a green thing. So that's easy to identify as Asian people. Asian people have a yellow hue. It's not like people are walking around like crayons, right? No. It's not like there's green people and red people and all that stuff. It's just there's this hue to the color. So mm -hmm. the Asian people are yellowish. So you find mercury is very dominant in Asian people, which is very interesting because, like, if you look at American people, you'll see they're very American, nat natural American people, Native American people. They're strong. Yes. You know, and if you look at Asian people, they're not so strong. They're more delicate. They're like mercury. And if you look at American people, there's, there's like a clear gender there. And it tends to be, Native Americans, they tend to be masculine looking, powerful. Even the women are just powerful. They look powerful. Mm -hmm. But if you go into Asia where, where mercury is pr predominant, a lot of times you can't differentiate a man and a woman. By, from afar, by eye. They get to look very, really, really similar because Mercury is that way too. So they start to get more delicate, more similar. Asians are uh, stereotyped as being really good with math. Right. Right. And they have a, this fantastic language also. That Chinese-based language is incredible. The structure, the words that they use and the inf inflections that they use. So yeah, Mercury is dominant in Asia. Okay. In Iran, too, I mean, we have a saying, the northern part of Iran, they tend to be more fair-skinned, and the direct translation is literally white, and then in the south, people get a little bit darker, and the literal translation is green people. Oh, wow. People who have, so, it, yeah, so it's yeah. that green complexion, I guess. Yeah, that's a problem. Interesting thing about words, like shama, it, some people say it's blue, some people say it's green, some, you know, it's some, this guy is saying it's a reddish shama. It just means a darkened color. Dark. So the sun's sun's color is like darkened, but it's not black like Saturn. It's darkened, yeah. like tanned. Okay. Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn are tawny, variegated, and dark. So he's got tawny mm -hmm. as being very similar to Mercury. But as as we said in that live class, Jupiter's tawniness, the, his he's a yellow that's on the orange side and mercury is a yellow that's on the green side but again you'll get yellow people now jupiter i can't remember what what race they were supposed to be i forgot about that but i know venus venus is definitely indian people i thought it should be more fair because it's that clear i imagine it's, it's, more it's interesting but see variegated you get tons of different colors in india just, there's a huge range of, of complexion in India. It's like the full spectrum. And also, yeah. if, you, if you look at the Indian eyes, yes. like you don't just think, don't limit yourself to colors. Think about the rest of the structure of the person. Like I'm saying about the American, Native Americans, they're very sharp, clear 
sturdy looking, like something with Mars or the sun or both. If you look at your uh, Caucasians, they just tend to get more fat. Caucasians <laughs> tend to be fat uh, and moony. Then, and they're white. And now if you look at Asians, they have that like bigendral thing and they're delicate and smaller and yellowish. If we look at Indians, they have these huge eyes. Mm -hmm. Indians have these huge, beautiful eyes. They have big, their bodies are very beautiful. Like, it, but India is harsh. The, the, the nature of the growing up in India is, is harsh. So you get old fast because the elements really, really assault you in India. But the Indian body on its own, it's just super gorgeous. The curves are amazing. Everything is really Venus. And the arts that they developed in India are so refined. Mm -hmm. The musical sensitivities, the colors, everything. They're super Venusian. But in recent history, they get dominated by other, other races. So things change in recent history. But they, well, the old Indian culture is very, very Venus oriented. And the Indian nature is very Venusian. They love, they have a lot of love at this very like warm hearted people. They're very family oriented and partnership oriented. Look, the men walk around holding each other's hands. They hug each other. They're not very macho. Indian people are not very macho. They're very, very Venus, Venusian. Affectionate. And then uh, Saturn is dark. So it's dark colors. So, so that's like African people. Are, it's classically, they got put into the most slavery. They got, they got the, classically, they get the most difficult social, you know, stratas and stuff. It's a, the black people. They get discriminated against and stuff like that. So it's very Saturnian stuff that they're dealing with. You know? So, yep. Yeah. So that's one thing you can do is you can say, well, okay, the different races will probably have different sensitivities to different plants, but also you can understand that the importance of this part of the text is that he's trying to teach you about the planets. Yeah. So that's one thing. One thing about showing the colors is you can, you can associate planets with different types of races. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's not like Jupiter. I'm not sure. Right? Mars. I'm not sure. But the other thing is that colors themselves convey convey meaning right mm -hmm. colors are another way of knowing what something is so you know redness in mars and the sun it shows that it's not safe it's dangerous it's powerful and the yellowness in the jupiter and mercury shows that it's alert the yellow color is very alert okay so darkness Sorry, talk about, can you hear the lawnmower outside yeah but it's not a big deal it's okay yeah okay the um the darkness in Saturn is showing that it's kind of Saturn is kind of down, depressed, you know? Mm -hmm. It's dark. And the what is it? The variegatedness in Jupiter in Venus. I'm always saying Venus is sparkly. Yes. Right? It's 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 showing that it's beautiful, it's attractive. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the by white, variegated fair, can fairness we, of Mercury. Yes. By variegated, can we imagine it as like the color spectrum? Yeah. If you have glass and you get all rays and shades of light, basically colors. Yeah. The Venus, is, Venus is not limited to one color. That's the thing. Okay. Venus has got its prismatic crystalline okay. color. Okay. So, you know, any, anything like sequins, prisms, rainbows, peacock feathers that are like, if you look at it this way, it's this mm -hmm. color. You look at it the other way, it's the other color. It's very Venus-y stuff. Okay, and I I know you said the commentary. We yeah. don't know who it is, but I wanted to actually ask you though the effect of let's say I have Jupiter in my ascendant, for example, or Venus, very close conjunct or aspect. Are these some things we should look at in terms of one's complexion and appearance? Yeah. But you're going to have to have your whole s system of astrology down pat before you can actually make sense of that. Okay, okay. You know what I mean? So you mm -hmm. can't just say, okay, this person has Saturn in the ascendant, they should be black. Right. Or this person is black but or very dark, but they don't have Saturn mm -hmm. in their ascendant. You know, well, maybe they're born into a dark race or a fair race because, you know, the, the like I was saying, different types of structures or sponges for different types of planets. Mm -hmm. But also it's not just like what's in your first house or something. 
you know, what's the most prominent planet in the horoscope in relation to physical things? So what's the planet that's affecting the ascendant the most, affecting the first Lord, affecting the moon, which affects the physical nature? Yeah. Sort that out. And don't just think about the planet, but the signs, you know, like if you have an, if you have a Capricorn or a, or a Sagitt- what the heck, Aquarius, if you have a Capricorn or Aquarius rising sign, then your physical structure is going to be more attuned to Saturn's because Saturn rules those. Right. right so it, it'll darken. Saturn does other things too, like elongates, makes it thin. Because mm-hmm. Saturn's dry. So if you know the thing, if you know the nature of how the things work when they're drier, when things are drier, it's easier for them to, they have less weight so they can stretch up a little higher. They can grow up a little higher. When things are thicker or wetter, they kind of get better and lower. So Saturn makes things taller and thinner. So you may not have Saturn anywhere near your ascendant, but you may have a Saturn ascendant, a Saturn ruled ascendant, Mm -hmm. the moon in a Saturn sign. You may have a Saturn ruled ascendant, but the moon is in Cancer. So it's going to be interesting. Now, what house is the moon in? That's going to make that part of the body full. But the overall body would be slender and tall. So you could get a really nice shape that way. You get a certain part of the body really full, but the rest of it's slender. Um, you know, you got to know the effects of it. Jupiter just makes things like expand and be yes. stocky and bigger. So the Jupiter ascendance, even if it has Saturn affecting it, if it's a Sagittarius or especially a Pisces ascendant, which is watery, yes. even if Saturn's affecting it, it's not going to get super tall or thin unless Saturn's really strongly affecting it. Mm-hmm. So you have to know, this is a good way to practice because you can see with your eyes. This is a good way to practice or develop your astrology system because it's, it's an objective and now it's fairly objective, reasonably objective. You can see the person with your eyes. So you can fine tune your system until you can interpret something from that chart that matches what you can see with your eyes and then take it to another chart and see if that same thing works with that person. It probably won't. Then you'll have to fine tune it some more and figure out a way to make it work with both charts and take it to a third chart. And then maybe it will work. Once you got it to work on two charts, there's a mm-hmm. 50, 50 chance it'll still work on the third. But eventually it won't work again and you'll have to fine tune it again. And you try to get to some kind of a system where it works on seven out of 10 charts. And then you've become a really good astrologer, whereas you've got like 70% reliability, mm-hmm. which is better than most people get from medical machines and things. Yes. Okay. Before moving on from this question, because that subsection 18 completely changes the tone. I wanted to, in terms of body appearance, I was wondering if I can just ask you, for example, someone who's underweight or overweight, balding or really thick hair. Yeah. What kind of planets, I have eight of them here. I was wondering if you can kind of give me a feel, because you were saying stereotype the planets to understand. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So let's say someone's very underweight what kind of planet combination or a very planet? underweight it's going to be saturn saturn yeah okay Five. well you're going to have a combination of things you can oh you can get things by add and like if you want to make a color lighter then you can add mm-hmm. more white or you can remove some black right yes so the same way if you want to make a person more skinny you can add more skinny planet or you can take away more fat planet and if you do both, then you really get a, a dramatic effect. So you can take Jupiter out of the picture, take Jupiter and the moon out of the picture, get Venus kind of far out of the way too, because Venus is sour and kind of puckers things up. Like the flavors are also important. The planets have flavors. I think he talks about it in their chapter two. The flavors affect the body. You know, sweet and sour are like fattening, but mm-hmm. salty and dry are thinning flavors. So Saturn and and things are thin. Yeah, you know, you can do some correlation like that too. So take Venus, okay. Jupiter, and the moon out of the way and mm-hmm. put Mars and Saturn really strong in the picture. Then you get a very skinny but sinewy. If you get Mars in there, there's muscle. It's not just weak skinniness. I see. Okay. You get a skinny sinuousness. If there's no Mars in the picture, it's just skinny. It might be unhealthy. Too skinny. Okay. Get. So, and you'll also see, you'll get other effects from it too, like Saturn's a cold planet. So coldness comes when there's no insulation. 
So right. Jupiter is nice because it gives insulation to the body. It gives fat. And then you don't get affected by the cold so much. You don't get sick as much. I see. Okay. But if you don't have Jupiter around, then you, your, your inner organs are more exposed to the outer elements. You don't have the layer of fat to protect. So okay. You get sick. So Saturn does that, thins out the body. People these days think thinning out the body is always good, but it's not always good. Mm-hmm. You need a good, you need a significant amount of fat, at least one layer around your whole, De- yeah. <laughs> Definitely. And then so I guess being overweight, we're talking about, you just said Jupiter, Moon, and Venus. Yeah, but now this is an also, <laughs> also an interesting thing is you want to think about the dignity of a planet, right? Yes. Because you think about the concept of being thin, for example, it can be wonderful or it can be unhealthy. So the same way Saturn will bring thinness, but if Saturn is like an exalted Saturn, then it brings really nice slenderness. You don't put on weight. Okay. You're healthy. But if Saturn is like debilitated, then it's going to mean, man, you're so sickly. You, I mean, you're just so skinny and sickly. See what I mean? So same thing with Jupiter. If Jupiter is not in a good dignity, then it's going to make you too fat, unhealthy. It's, you can't mm-hmm. lose weight. But if right. Jupiter is in a very good dignity and affecting your ascendant, then you have that fat that's healthy. Fat is your bat- battery pack also. Mm-hmm. So like you yeah. have this healthy energy storage, you have an insulation insulator, it looks good. It's like mm-hmm. a little coat. It's like a fluffy coat on your body. It l- looks good. So a Jupiter that's healthy gives you really good fat. And a Jupiter that's not healthy makes you too fat. Okay. Okay. And what about thinning hair and really good head of hair? Yeah. Hair in general. Yeah, yeah. So this is also interesting. It's also useful to know how the elements, you know, interact and know a little bit of Ayurvedic ideas. about okay. You know, so like acids are masculine and alkalines. Acid. Yeah, acids. Oh, okay. Acidic things are, are masculine and alkalines are feminine. So you, like hair, beautiful hair is feminine. So you, right. if the body has lots of healthy alkaline in it, then it'll generate nails, really st- nice strong nails, nice strong hair. Everything will be beautiful. The eyelashes will get bigger and thicker. Okay. Stuff like that. But if a body has lots of acid in it, it can get muscle. Now it gets muscle because acid digests. But it's going to mm-hmm. lose this. The nails will get thinner the hair will get thinner and fall out. You get all this heat and the, t- the top of your head is the most susceptible too mm-hmm. because heat rises. The acid is hot. It's fire. It's described as fire sometimes. So the heat in the body rises and then heat dries things out. So your hair follicles, if they get dried out, symbolically speaking, medically speaking, you know, mm-hmm. in symbolic medicine speaking, if the hair follicles get dried out from the inside, they'll die. They'll fall out. So if the body's got too much acid in it, then you're going to go bald. And that's why men go bald, because we have the male body is made by the sun and Mars. Right. So it's just got tons more acidic nature to it as a, as a baseline, as a starting point. Mm-hmm. And testosterone boosts the metabolism, which is body's heat. Yeah. And, metabolize. and you know how men, men eat like a lot more than women? Yes. Oh. It's because we have that. We have tons of acids in our body. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because we have lots of Mars. So if you see somebody is bald, you can expect a fire rising sign. And you can expect the fire planets to be affecting all the physical key points, like the Ascendant, the First Lord. The moon. Okay. So therefore, Mars, Sun, and fire signs will give you okay. muscle, let's hope, and will give you metabolism, mm-hmm. but it's not good for your hair. Okay. So if you want to keep your hair, I mean, there's different approaches that you can take. Then you you want to eat cooling foods. foods. And you also, you don't want a a man, the more sexually active the man is, Mm -hmm. the more their hair falls out. It's ironic because they get more, the more testosterone that's in your body. That's the, that's one of the primary acids. It's a it's a primary hormone, and it's going to create acid, and it's going to make you hair fall. So you keep your eye on that if you want to know what the man who's like mellow and the man who's not mellow see how much hair they got. The hair. Yeah. And uh, the next one was about the proportions of the body. For example, having extraordinary small feet or big feet or hands. 
or us, you know? Hmm. Extraordinarily big. Yeah, it's like someone's feet. I've seen this. Someone's hands will be very small in proportion to the rest to their of their body. body. Is that body that parts? to analyze that one. That would be a cool thing to mm-hmm. Planets are small, medium, and large. Signs are also small, medium, and large. And then houses correspond to different parts of the body. That's oh. probably your basis for how to figure it out. Okay. I think I think I'm not just quite sure because, I mean, how much time do I spend? As an astrologer, it's good to – this would be great to practice. But how much mm-hmm. does – nobody really comes to me and asks me, what size are my hands? So I don't really do – does this kind of work much so i'm not too familiar with it but um as far as i remember saturn is big because it's elongating jupiter is big because it's thickening mars is shortening okay i'm not so sure on the other ones i think mercury is making it more delicate and then i can't remember how the signs are organized either but i think the basis of it is you would expect the like if somebody has extraordinarily small hands get a really shortening planet to very strongly affect the cusp of the third house. Okay. Because the third house is where your hands are and arms. Yes. You might look in the nakshatras. You know, you can think about hasta in the nakshatras. I don't know. So it's more complicated than oh, just... Because think of your question. It's very exact. Yeah. Your question okay. is really exact. I want to know something about this particular bodily limb. My hands. Okay. So investigative work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then the last question, it is addressed. I remember when I was just going through the two volumes we we're studying, there was something about moles and beauty marks. Hmm. Is it, uh, which planet actually causes these? I come from a family where we have maps outlined on our body with just Me too. dots. Me too. Yes. And, in, yeah. and here in Japan, nobody has them. No Nobody one has, has dots. Like they don't have dots. We, my, I don't know. My family would call them beauty marks. Yes. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Yes. Um, and in Japan, it's really rare. Like my eyes will spot because I have Chitra. My chit. I have Jupiter and Chitra is my main planet. I'm always looking around at things, yes. like looking at shapes and colors. And so, as soon as I see somebody with a dot on their face, my eyes are like a magnet. Like, wow, you have a dot on your face because it's so rare to see it now. <laughs> So I think uh, the planets that are described as tawny or speckled. What, can you say that again? Tawny, remember in this colored oh, verse that we looked yes. at? Yes. I mean, probably not with the moon. The moon is gory. So gory is very fair. It's going to be a clean complexion. It's not going to have a dot on it it's, or freckles. Okay. But uh, something like Mercury, uh, he doesn't call it tawny, but I'll say Mercury, mm-hmm. Jupiter, they can put freckles or dots. Mercury? Yeah. Okay. And remember, they're called beauty marks. I mean, they're, they're yeah. beautiful. It's like a little accent somewhere. You get this accent mark. So it can come from Venus. Okay. Because Venus is also variegated, so it'll put something special. Okay. But this, this is also like a very interesting specific thing. It'll be cool to investigate it. Mars can put a mark, right? But it probably wouldn't be a beauty mark. It would be like a birthmark okay. or a scar or like a stretch or something. You can get that, you can get that from Mars. Okay. So like, if you, like I, a lot of times you see kids with birthmarks on the back of their neck mm-hmm. from the birth, actually from the birth. Or, you know, sometimes you see people with like a big birthmark on their forehead. Yes. It would be really cool to look at their chart and figure out how is it that Mars is affecting the first house. Because it's not just the body, but it's the head. That's so interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. I was once thinking for Halloween, just take a marker and connect these dots. I'll be a map. You could do constellations. I have constellations on my leg. They look like constellations. Yeah. That's crazy. I like them, but you you can't show your legs too often, so. No. (laughs) yes okay should i move to the 18 number 18 because it's completely different now we have time if you're ready for it yes i'm ready should i just read the straight translation 
Well, this is actually 19 is amazing. I can't wait to go to 19. Yeah, okay, let's too. do 18. Because 18 is so vague. It doesn't give any explanation for what he says. And he says a lot. It says planetary deities, fire, yeah. Agni, water of Varuna, Kartikeya, Lord Shiva's son following Ganesh, Vishnu, Indra, Shachi? Yeah. Um, which is Lord Indra's consort, Brahma, are the presiding deities of the seven planets, respectively. And then he just cuts it out. So I wanted to know which planet is related to the presiding deity or... Oh, respectively means he's got his order. The, okay. the order of the planets is Sun, Moon, Mercury. Uh, sun, Moon, Mars. Oh. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You know, Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, yes. Venus, Saturn. That's the order. So when he says respectively, it means the sun is fire, the moon is water, or the moon is the sun is Agni, the moon is Varuna, Mars is Kartikeya, Mercury is Vishnu, Jupiter mm -hmm. is Indra. But yes. Let's look and see. Jupiter is Indra, Venus is Shachi, Indrani, yes. and then Saturn is Brahma. So this is very interesting. Now, and yes. he just leaves it at that because his audience knows these knows this topic very well oh, it's like okay. if we said identified characters from friends the friends tv show or something mm -hmm. wouldn't have to explain who the characters were everybody would know who it is mm -hmm. so let me look at see yeah it's a little different uh -huh, uh -huh. And Kartike is related to Mars? Definitely. You know who Kartike is? It's the Kritika, the mothers who took care. I remember something They're of the... They're not the mothers, though. It's the child. The child They're... is Kartike. Oh, the child is Kartike. Okay. Yeah. The child is the... is Sh Shiva had a child born specifically to kill this demon. There was what? a demon that could only be killed by somebody who was less than seven days old. I see. Okay. So he thought he was totally safe. Like, how could a seven-day-old child even mm -hmm. walk? So, but Shiva was able to make a child who could become full-grown in seven days. But it took him centuries to be able to conceive that child with his with wow. with Parvati. So they were getting harassed by this demon for a long time, but eventually they had Kartikeya, and okay. Kartikeya was a martial madman. He was just like. A, war, a warrior i mean he's from born from the destroyers the rudras and he's born to kill somebody so he's like really really aggressive now in india in south india they love kartikeya right so and they'll, they'll treat him as like a deity in, in and of himself so they're going to ascribe all kinds of divine qualities to kartikeya and i don't mean to step on that for anybody but the basic thing about kartikeya is that he's born from shiva for the point of killing forget the name of this demon and he grew up in seven days and just w walked out there and decimated all the asura armies and then had nothing left to do and then he became troublesome actually there's nothing left to do but he still has he's still this warrior he had to figure out how to like cope you know like a warrior when there's no war what do they do they might cause trouble if you don't yeah. give him something good so he had to figure it out but eventually he figures it out and he becomes a positive person Okay. So, but that's Mars. That's why he relates to Mars because he's just like he's got that. He's got ferocious energy, and he can kill things. Kartike okay. is the god of war. Okay. But uh, the moon with Varuna is interesting. Mm -hmm. Varuna. So it's definitely Varuna. Yes. Agni is uh, is obvious, right? For the sun, fire. The sun should mm -hmm. be the associated with fire the moon should be associated with water but but it's interesting that he says water it's not apas or something it's varuna mm -hmm. varuna is not really water but varuna is like actually this big enclosing space and as you know i think from a lot of the things i've said he gets banished to the waters yes. and then he becomes the superintendent of water so you can say moon but you could say moon is associated with water or space it's also the Lord of space. Like it's the night maker. In the previous verse, he called the moon the night maker and the sun the day maker. So the sun is the, the one who makes the day, but the moon makes the night. And you can't, in the night, you can see the all of space. So the moon is associated with Varuna on that level. That okay. Varuna is all space and also because the moon is very watery. Okay. Jupiter wouldn't be associated with space? It is by elements. 
but, you know, um, but that's when you're going to go with med- medicine. Okay. When you're talking about medicinal things and you go straight to the things that are called tattvas or but- mahabhutas, the five elements mm-hmm. that, con- that constitute physical things. Okay. So then Jupiter is ether. And also when, he, when you want to figure out what sensory perception a planet is associated with, then you'll use that five element scheme because each element carries a sensual, carries a sensual message. Like in other words, ether carries sound. It carries the mm-hmm. sensory message for sound. And air carries tact- tactile sense. Mm-hmm. It lets you touch things. That's why there's body here. So they can be sensitive to the movement of the air. And then there's um, fire. It carries light. It carries, so it carries color and things. like So like that, if you want to see if somebody is sensorily impaired, mm-hmm. the sensual impairment would correspond to the element that carries okay. that sense, which has a lot to do with the planet associated with that element. So in that case, you would also think of Jupiter for hearing. Okay. Um, but here... Jupiter is for Indra, which is interesting. Let's first do Mercury and Vishnu. Yes. This is very important because Vishnu is very fair. Mm-hmm. And also Varuna is very fair. This is another reason why the moon. The moon is very fair. The moon, it will, be, will make friends with anybody. Not everybody wants to make friends with the moon, but the moon, it will make friends with anybody. Yes. So it's, it's fair. It's a fair planet also. It's not really biased. It's open to anything. And Mercury is also very unbiased, very open to any, anybody. He treats everybody equally, likes e- equalness. Mercury loves equalness mm-hmm. and balance. And so that's Vishnu. Vishnu actually says, mm-hmm. I just treat everybody the way they treat me. Okay. Yeah, I don't have any bias towards anybody, but I do treat people differently. But it's not my bias that makes, them, makes me treat them differently. It depends on how they, they want me to treat them. So you'll see Vishnu usually helping the gods but that's because the gods are the ones that go to Vishnu for help the asuras feel like we shouldn't have to go to Vishnu for help we're strong on our own Mm -hmm. but occasionally when the asuras go to Vishnu for help he helps them like Prahlad Bali there's very famous cases in the Puranas where he's helping the asuras just as much as he helps the devas so it's very fair Mercury is very fair and Vishnu is also the consciousness so the perception and the acuity and the awareness of everything that's also very Mercury connected with the mercury okay. it's not this is not to be used for saying like what god should you worship or you know like oh you must be a Hare krishna because you have strong mercury and mercury is vishnu and krishna is an incarnation of vishnu mm-hmm. not about that at all it's just trying to it's just trying to teach you about the planet really I'm not trying to say mm-hmm. anything about vishnu or mm-hmm. or kartikeya it's trying to teach you about the planet but don't use it backwards to try to figure out the God or what your, your relationship with the God is by looking at astrology. Try to figure out astrology by knowing what you know about the gods. Yes. All right. And Jupiter. Let me look at the Sanskrit for Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Indra and Jupiter is very, I was Where is Indra written in this text? Oh no, it says Indrani. No, it is well, no, Indrani Shachi. and Shachika. Vishnu Vinoja. I guess by saying that Vishnu is the younger brother of Indra, Vishnu is the youngest brother of Indra, ironically. It, it not because Vishnu has avatars. This is another thing that when somebody becomes a very a big fan or a worshiper of a god, they trip on certain things like, you know, you can't say that Shiva comes from Brahma's forehead. Shiva is the original god, but it doesn't matter. Like, the sunlight can come through a window. It doesn't mean that the sun didn't exist before the window was built. Mm-hmm. You know, so these Vishnu and Shiva they have avatars at certain points in time through certain other beings. It doesn't mean that they're not the ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. So this particular avatar of Vishnu called Trivikram or Vamana was born as Aditi's youngest son to help Indra. And once, because, because Aditi asked Vishnu, my son is wholly out of luck. 
the Asuras have kicked him out. You know, please help. You're the only one who can help. So he said, I'll become your child. So they, he's called the younger brother of Indra, which also shows that Vishnu is totally humble. Like Mercury is not pompous. Mm -hmm. Mercury is just very, it doesn't mind being, it can be strong. Like Vamana all of a sudden became huge and powerful and took over Bali's whole kingdom. But before that, he was a dwarf and small and very humble. So Mercury can play any, any role it needs to. It can switch around and do anything it wants. So by saying that, the, by listing the Indra and saying that, by saying Mercury is Vishnu and then there's the brother of Vishnu, it's saying the next planet in order belongs to the brother of Vishnu, who's most likely Indra. Now, why the heck is Jupiter Indra? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know, but it does make sense with all the Roman and the Greek stuff. Right, Jupiter literally is Indra, in in the Roman pantheon. And Jova, that's Indra. The the god of Jupiter, Zeus, and all those guys. Jupiter, Zeus is the same one. Mm. That's Indra with the lightning bolt, the king of the gods. Yes. So it's all the same. So the, maybe the Indian format is just following the Roman format here, or maybe they thought about it themselves. So they came up with this thing that Indra is. The Thing, the law and Indra laying down the law as yeah I guess so but I guess so Indra the, the, it, that's not really Indra's thing though that was Varuna's thing and then Indra couldn't hack it it had to go to Yama when Indra took over he couldn't take all of Varuna's responsibilities so he, some of them got delegated and the laying down the law part is no more in the hands of the king of the gods it was when Varuna was the king but after Varuna was exiled, then they put that power in to Yama's hands, because Indra wouldn't, couldn't, wasn't capable. Okay. So I don't know. I don't think it's because of that. That would be great. Or, you know, or maybe it's just meaning that Jupiter is the best. The Indra just means best in general, yeah. biggest, best. You know, this. You know what else this could mean? If the translation, if we really investigate the translation, it could mean that this is Indra's priest. Oh, oh prosperity, right? Prosperity, and that would be. make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. That does make if, sense. If we took time to really look into the Sanskrit, we might be able to see that in there. That okay. Jupiter is Brihaspati. Okay. Venus being Shachi is totally sensible though. Because Shachi is the most is the queen of paradise. Indra is the king of paradise, Shachi is the queen of paradise. So she's like the she knows every art form, she knows all the yeah, she knows like all the, anything with beauty, anything with dance, anything with music, anything with lovemaking, anything with cooking, anything with anything. All art, painting, poetry, she knows them all. So that's okay. all why she's, you know, Venus is like her. She's like Venus, Shachi. Okay. Now why Brahma? Ka. Now he's just called Ka. Mm -hmm. This is an important thing in astrology. A lot they don't often say Brahma; they say Ka, because Ka is an, is the Vedic view of Brahma. The Puranic view of Brahma is that he's very very wise. That's why they call him Brahma. He's carrying the the wisdom that Vishnu gave him in all the Veda, so he's addressed as Brahma. In the Vedic thing, they don't care that much about wisdom. <laughs> like okay it's this might be mind blower for people when you say vedic you might be talking about the whole vedic library in which the statement i just made would be false if, okay. if you all right but you can subdivide the vedic library into three sections one of them is the philosophical section and, the, and one of them is the worship section one's the philosophical mm -hmm. section and one is the ritual section Yes. The ritual section is described mostly in the Vedic, Vedic part of the Vedas, the actual like original texts that mm -hmm. are very, they're called the Samhitas, the original songs. Yes. And then the explanations of those songs is what the philosophical portions are. Mm -hmm. And then derivations on that, like explaining the characters in those songs mm -hmm. is the worship part. So when I say that the Vedic part doesn't really care about philosophy, that's what I mean. It's the ritual. It's the part of the Veda that's all about rituals. They think about Brahma as being the one who's got the most virility okay. because he's the original progenitor. 
He's the original father of the whole universe. Okay. Now, why that would be associated with Saturn, that's really interesting. Maybe I would expect it would be easy to make sense if they said Yama. Mm-hmm. Yama is Saturn because Saturn is disciplinarian and strict and kind of deep and depressed, depressive. But they say Brahma. This has got power. So Saturn is like, this is another instance of you can get the color to be lighter if you take out white, if you add white or if you take out black. So Saturn is also, if Saturn is the planet of negativity, mm-hmm. that means that he can make you positive. Yes. You understand? Yeah, right. You understand that. People don't really get it. They say, well, Vic, why do you talk bad about Saturn? I'm not talking bad about Saturn. I'm just saying Saturn signifies negativity. Mm-hmm. So now I'm not saying anything bad about Saturn or Saturn is signifies depression. That means Saturn can control depression. Saturn can control negativity. Saturn can make it not harmful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that may be the thing. I know people think of Saturn being like in the lower part of the body. And that's also what Ka is down. It's the first, the significance of the word Ka is that it's the first consonant. So it's like it's the root of everything. Saturn is like down at the root of everything. But this is an interesting one that's a bit mystifying for me, why Saturn is related with Ka. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, see, the commentator says here, you should worship the planet, the deity associated with the planet as a remedy. But did Parashar Mm -hmm. say that in in uh, in the last chapter of the book? He didn't. No. So the commentator is making, putting in his own idea here, which is what I don't like. If you have your own idea, write your own book. Right. If you're making a commentary, explain what the, what the original book is saying and leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Should yeah. I ask another question related to this part? Or totally. we only have four minutes? No, totally. Ask another question. It's Okay. Okay, so this is what I was thinking. So we learned about the nakshatras and how they have, they're associated to certain deities. Now planets are being associated to certain deities. So let's say I'm reading a chart and I'm looking at the nakshatras and I'm looking at the planets. Am I supposed to blend these? Should we blend these? No, that's what I'm trying to say, right? Look at this chapter. See, don't lose your mind. (laughs) <laughs> don't use your common sense don't lose your common sense remember how you read a book you don't just isolate a sentence and then just interpret that sentence all by itself you can you look at the paragraph mm-hmm. and you look at the chapter and you look at the title of the book and you think about the author and then you really understand the sentence so if you're just looking at one verse in a in a text don't go mm-hmm. too wild with trying to figure out what it means like saturn is we could sit there and go crazy with why is saturn ka why is saturn from uh, right. you go crazy with that you could explore all kinds of wild possibilities and you just get further and further away from the more you drill into one word the more you actually get further and further away from the whole context of the thing very often unless you're very smart um so think about the context of what this chapter is about he's ta- he's trying to teach maitreya parashar is mm-hmm. teaching maitreya what the planets signify he's not teaching maitreya about colors He's not teaching Maitreya about government. He's not teaching Maitreya about gender or, or gods. He's teaching him about planets. So the information here is not about gods. It's about the planets. You don't interpret, this commentator doesn't, doesn't get that. He says, look, this, these gods are important in relation to these planets. No, he's just trying to teach you. Saturn acts like Agni. I mean, sun acts like Agni. Moon acts like Varuna. Then you interpret when you're interpreting the moon, think about Varuna's qualities. When you're interpreting Saturn, think about Brahma's qualities. That's another that's one possible reason. Saturn is very logical. Saturn is very logical. And also Saturn Ka has problem. Jupiter uh Brahma has a problem with marriage also. Mm-hmm. So Saturn is also not really part a partnery thing. It's not a partnery planet. That could be one of the reasons too. But the thing is, what your effort is, is to try to understand the planet, not the deva. So the nakshatras, even the nakshatras, the nakshatras are not going to teach you about the devas, no. the gods. The gods will teach you about the nakshatras. Right. And they're not saying that nobody ever says that you should worship. Nobody means nobody 
authoritative ever says that you should worship the deva of your nakshatra. The mm -hmm. so Vedanga Jyotish just says that you should do your uh, religious deeds in the name of the deva of your nakshatra. Using the name of the deva of your nakshatra, you should do your religious deeds. You know, so one is not puffed up thinking I'm, I'm doing this, but you say in the name of Nirti, I perform this great, this, this charity. It's not me, but it's the Nirti's blessing that I can do this charity because my moon is Mula. So I say it in the name of Nirti. Or I may even name myself. When you name yourself for the ceremony, in the mm -hmm. beginning of the Vedic ceremony, they still do this in the Buddhist ceremonies here in Japan. In the beginning of a ceremony, you announce the names of the performer. Right. But it may not be your true name. Mm -hmm. It will be some name associated with your nakshatra. I see. Okay. Okay. So what, your question exactly was like, like how do you know? Okay, but... Mm -hmm. The, the, but it, you, one way of interpreting what a person is like is to see it in terms of a mixture of different gods. It's a person like a mixture of different gods, right? So then, yes, then you would want to mix. All right, yeah. the person's got a Rohini. Wow. Mm -hmm. The person's got a Rohini moon. Rohini mm -hmm. is associated with Ka, Brahma. Yes. And they have a prominent Saturn. Saturn is also associated with Brahma, Ka. Mm -hmm. So, wow, there's a lot of Brahma ness. In this person. Okay. Okay. And if that's handy for you, for most people, it would be easier to say there's a lot of Luke Skywalker in this person because we know Luke Skywalker better than Brahma. <laughs> right. Right. But that's how handy. That's how handy this was to the audience for whom this book was written. Right. Because they knew they knew a lot about Varuna. They knew a lot about Agni. They'd grown up from childhood hearing the stories about these. Mm -hmm. So it was very useful for the, the author Prashar to say Sachi is Venus and you know Vishnu mm -hmm. is Mercury. It would give a lot of meaning to what Mercury is really like. Okay. And were these oral teachings back in the day? They must have been, right? They say so. They okay. say that the they say so. Um if you I have a class called the What are the Vedas? Mm -hmm. which explains this in the first session. I think it's six session class that explains this in the first session. The Vedas begin as a, as a oral, as a nonverbal transmission of knowledge from Vishnu to Brahma, just a, just a mental transmission, it's like a telepathic transmission. It's Brahma who tries to put it into words. And that's how Vak and Saraswati manifest through Brahma's effort. The goddess of, of words and speech and intelligence mm -hmm. manifest from Brahma's effort to verbalize what he learned from Vishnu. And then, then he managed with the help of the seven sages who he created to get it into a verbal form. And then they taught because they didn't, their minds were like computer disks. Mm -hmm. so they had such strong memory that paper wasn't necessary. They would only use writing for very, very, very boring things like lists or numbers, things that were really hard to remember, really uncompelling data they would write down. And it wasn't until classically known as about 5,000 years ago, which was the dawn of the current era, that people realized that this has to be written down or otherwise everybody's going to forget it. And so then there was a special avatar of Vishnu Vyas, who said, all right, he was the one who figured out how to take all this huge, it had proliferated quite a bit, over the centuries from over the millennia from Brahma and it proliferated from different teachers and explanations. So he was the one who was capable of taking all this vast spoken schools of thought, editing them down to something that you could write and read and putting it, getting it put on paper. They say Ganesh actually did the writing. Right. Um, he wrote the whole Vedas, right? No, he didn't even do that, actually. He wrote, mm -hmm. he wrote down the cores of them. He, he took out the core texts from the original Veda that Brahma had created, and he got them written down. Then he gave them to, he, he put different people in charge of different branches, different, okay. say, different teachers, different scholars he put in charge of the different branches. So he had five people in charge of five branches. And, and he, he told each one to create a school 
create like a college and develop it. So he, he, his idea wasn't that, okay, now it's set in stone, it's finished. His idea was this is the core of the thing now. It has to be explained and taught to people mm-hmm. responding to their questions about it. You know, knowledge is a living thing. That's another reason why it's not so useful to write knowledge down because mm-hmm. you have to interact with it. Mm-hmm. So he, even, even after he wrote it down, he, he gave it to teachers and he said, now you got to teach it to the students and keep a record of what you're teaching because that interaction between teacher and student will be useful. That's how Upanishads and those Brahmanas, like Taittiriya Brahmana, Aranya, because they all developed as a result of teachers teaching students. And then when they, you know, had a really great conversation, they recorded it. When there's a really good question, then they feel like they really gave the right answer. They recorded it. And those became the Upanishads and the other books that made the Vedas get bigger and bigger and bigger. I see. Okay. Yeah. And Vyas was actually supervising that for a long time because Vyas was superhuman. He was a, an, inc- an avatar. He was supervising it for many generations, the growth of the Vedas, but not directly writing it. But, and then at a certain point, he said, this has gotten too big. Nobody, it's gotten too big and too diverse. Mm-hmm. And these humans and, uh, have short lives now. And they don't have good attention spans. So I've, I'm writing this down for these humans of this age, but these humans of this age are not going to be able to make mm-hmm. use of this stuff. That's the result. So he said, I have to work on this more myself. So at, right. at the end of a couple of generations of teachers and students generating Upanishads, he sat down again to create, his, to create a new thing. It's not from Brahma's original Veda, mm-hmm. but he like synthesized all the teachings right. into this thing called the Vedanta Sutra, which is the, you would to translate it as the essential theme, the essential conclusion of the Vedas. That's what, how you should translate Vedanta Sutra. He wrote this very short book giving the essential conclusions of the ultimate, Mm -hmm. you know, Veda. Then he thought this is also too mysterious. It's so short and compacted. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me illustrate it with a story. Then he, he wrote the Mahabharata. And then he thought, but I, I, it's like, it's not, now it's not balanced. The philosophical stuff is in one book and the story is in another book. So it's, Mm -hmm. they need to be together. And then he revised one of the Puranas to create, Bhagavad Purana, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. The original Purana was called Bhagavad Purana, and then he created Srimad Bhagavatam, which was a synthesis of the storytelling, an illustration of the Mahabharata with the philosophical content of the Vedanta Sutra. Brahma was nowhere in that. It's not a book of the Vedas. It's just a book about astrology. Mm-hmm. But if it's a very old book, then it would follow the same thing. If it's, if it's a book that predates the Kali Yuga, then it would have originally been in oral form. But at a certain point, it gets written down. Then you start to get things more uh, standardized. Once, when something is oral, it's not standardized. Mm-hmm. You may teach it differently than I teach it. Mm-hmm. Once you get it written down, it starts to get standardized. But even then, it's not st- standardized. Until, the, until you get mass production. Mm-hmm. So books are actually a lot more fluid than people imagine. Because in this day and age, they're so standardized because now we have digital print. So yeah. it's so easy to disseminate one, one copy of something to thousands and millions of people. But in the old days, you could even copy it. You would have to copy a book by hand and you could copy it differently. You might make a mistake, you might change, you might add something. Oh, you know what? This little section could use a little more explanation. Mm-hmm. Or this is an unnecessary, boring part of the book. I'm not going to include this in my copy. So right. as you go to really old versions of books, they're not all the same. Even though they're all written down, they're not all the same. And it's not till recent time with the, till the printing press that you get. Yeah. And then you have the like university type scholar steps in on the scene and tries to what do they call it? Critical editions. They try to make the critical edition where they say, this is the one that we're going to accept as the authorized version of this book. So who knows what Brihat, Parahorash, what Brihat Parashara Horashastra was originally. All we know is what we have now. Brihat Parashara Horashastra is particularly suspect. Out of mm. all the books of astrology, this is one of the worst in the sense of having actual historical continuity because it was completely non-existent for centuries. 
it was only known that there was a book of this title because other books talked about it, but nobody could find a copy of the book for centuries, I think like 10 centuries or eight centuries. And then the pundit went around and somehow reassembled it. Hmm. So, you know, it's, well, the way I think about this book is, yeah, it's definitely Frankensteinian mm -hmm. and it's not organized. There's no flow, it's very little flow, Frankensteinian, but there's sections in this book which are obviously super genius. And then there's other sections which are like, eh. So I kind of mm -hmm. sort out like the Frankensteinian parts on that basis. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you, we can cross-reference this with other older texts, right? Yeah. yeah. But we don't really even know how old this text is. This is just a book that popped up in the 18th century claiming to be the Parashara or Hora Shastra. But you know what? I don't care. The thing is, I don't care. Like the book to me is not so important. I mean, it's not that important to me if this was written 95 million years ago or if it was written yesterday. What I care about is what's in it. Right. Yeah. And what's okay. in this book, it's sometimes confusing and sometimes out of order and sometimes contradictory. But the, se the sections in it have their have their brilliance so there's like brilliant sections like calculation of shadbala mm -hmm. ashtag varga Cal uh, those the section that we're doing on fridays or thursdays about the planetary mantras is that is brilliant I, o only somebody like parashara could have written that only somebody who knows the vedas so perfectly could have written that particular section okay thank you so much for the section these three sections. All right. Thank you. So the next time we're going to do the... Sex of the planets. Yes. Yes. Do... <laughs> Primordial. <laughs> then the next verse they have is the five elements, which we talked a little bit about today. Yes. If you want to keep going with this, I'd love to. This is so useful. I'd love to if you're not getting bored with doing everything all over again. <laughs> no, this is the most important stuff. Like I always yes. say, everybody has to just learn this about the planets more and more and more and more and more. Yes. You don't have to learn Ashtag Varga and Shadbala. You have to learn more about planets. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. I'll until next you. time. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.